So uh, just uh, again, thank you for coming on the call. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you all here. We, we took a break for the summer uh, and now we are starting with the new series. Uh, we have some exciting uh, presentations uh, scheduled this year with Erwin uh, opening up the, the series. Um, and I'm just uh, here on the screen. I, I hope you can, yes, it says you are screen, you are screen sharing. So you should be able to see uh, the seminar rules. These are straight from my email and I'm not gonna take you through all, through all of them, but just the discussion queue, so four and, and five. Uh, so I think um, sometimes the chat feature can be a little chaotic or not chaotic, um, distracting, right? For, for the presenter, at least when I am presenting and there is chat, I, I get distracted. So I would say keep on do using the chat, but for the presenter, no worries. We, I will share the chat with you after, after the call and um, we will basically start the queue once uh, Erwin is done with the presentation, I will start, uh, start the queue. And, uh, uh, Erwin and I exchanged some emails and also for the future presentations, we would like to limit those to 25 minutes just so that there's more, more time for, for feedback. And um, as for the presentation, I don't know if Erwin uh, requires a, an introduction to, to this group because we, we all know him, we've followed his work in the past, but he's now a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. And the paper he will uh, present today is co-authored with uh, Julian Grados, who is a PhD uh, candidate. Is Julian with us on the call? Uh, yeah, yes. he is. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hello, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, and um, Erwin uh, is an um, author of two books uh, and uh, editor of, of one. So um, uh, the Viennese Student of Civilization um, all these books are highly recommended, but in particular, I think for our group, it's the Divine Students of Civilization. It's, it's a must read because it really um, it's, uh, gives uh, a certain context to, to the enterprise, right? To this like Smith and Menger line of work or the uh, what Betke often calls the mainline. Um, Thinking in economics, it uh, Erwin places it in a in a broader context that's neither Austria nor Austria nor economics. So if you haven't had a chance to read that book yet, I, I highly recommend it. Okay, so that's all uh, from me, Erwin. The the screen the screen is yours, and yeah, we'll we'll chat in twenty five minutes. Okay. Okay. Um... You will stop sharing, uh, Marta. I, I think you could, should be okay. Uh, oh, okay. Stop share. Okay. Yeah. So I would also recommend the final volume, which is coming out in a month or two. And Michelle, who's also now on the call, is also has a chapter in that book. And Julien has a wonderful chapter. So Michelle has written on whiskey and Julien on the trolls on, on online and why they uh, are only 90% bad. Um, um, so, th so thanks everybody for joining. Um, like Marta said, this paper is uh, joint work with, uh, with Julien, um, who is doing a PhD uh, in Lille, um, broadly on issues of, of, of yeah. I, I, for a while, had this research program in my mind of quality coordination on markets. I'm not sure whether he would describe his own PhD as precisely that, but it's certainly on, on how economists have thought about quality. Um, now, one quality of goods is that they uh, are repugnant. And uh, so Julien and I were part of a workshop organized by Vinir, um, or more particularly by Alain Marciano, uh, who I think most of us know um, in the spring um, on this theme of repugnance, um, which has basically um, been introduced uh, through uh, moral or political philosophy especially through the work of Deborah Satz, um, but it's also been picked up by Elvin Roth, who claims that he can uh, sort of bypass the repugnance of markets by uh, setting up alternative institutional mechanisms, in particular matching markets, for example, for, for um, organ donors um, and the like. Um, but most of the literature on repugnance um, is normative in uh, nature. So it asks what goods should be for sale and what goods should not be for sale, right? And uh, we have people from the libertarian side, such as Brennan and Jaworski, saying that basically anything that um, is exchanged through other mechanisms, non-market mechanisms, should also be exchanged through market mechanisms. And we have um, more progressive 
uh, political and moral philosophers arguing that there should be uh, boundaries to markets. Um, in particular, in Deborah Satz, you get conditions of weak agency or the possibility of exploitation, which uh, would be reasons for not having market mechanisms. Now, while we think that this theme is extremely relevant, we don't actually uh, continue their normative focus in this paper, and I think a couple of the follow-up um, papers that we want to do on this subject. Um, but first, let me say one or two things about repugnance. I think it's a bit of a strange concept, actually. So all of the literature use it, uses it, so we, we're relying on it here, too. Um, but it's just intense disgust, and it has sort of natural connotations, right? Repugnance is something you almost feel in your gut, um, and it's a sort of a, a natural feeling of repugnance. And I think uh, we would benefit much by recognizing that repugnance is often a social phenomenon that differs across time and place, and it's actually quite culturally sensitive. And so in the beginning of the paper, we try to redefine repugnance more as the negative symbolic value or the negative uh, sort of uh, cultural meaning of particular goods or activities rather than as a sort of natural phenomenon. Yeah. Um, now, I don't think anyone, everyone does this, but particularly in Elvin Roth, you find really a treatment of repugnance as sort of a, a, an almost a natural kind or a natural fact, which you can't do anything about it. So it's a very hard constraint. Even though you, you might, uh, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that, but our paper treats it a bit exogenous. Um, I don't think thinking exogenously, fully exogenously about repugnance is the right way to go. Um, so this literature is focused on the moral discussion, what should and should not be for sale, but we want to um, make a sort of empirical turn in this study of repugnance and treat it more as a social phenomenon that influences market behavior of various market participants, but we needed a starting point and we decided that the starting point for it should be uh, looking at how firms uh, deal with repugnance. Um, I don't think there's a, a very much a, a sort of a analytical reason for starting with firms, um, but we wanted to start something somewhere in this empirical um, a project. So at the very end, I will say something about uh, some other empirical avenues that we hope to walk down in the, in the future. But for now, we've, we've focused on firms and how they deal uh, with repugnance. Okay. Um, so what does that mean to manage repugnance? Well, it means that uh, firms or consumers deal with activities that are considered um, uh, in a negative way or with disgust or with a stigma, um, right, is a word that sociologists would be more prone to use. Um, and they um, nonetheless want to engage in this activity or this consumption behavior or this pr pr production behavior. And um, so they somehow have to um, overcome the repugnance or accept the repugnance or um, manage the repugnance in some other way. Now, the first sort of obvious strategy that we identify also in the paper is that th therefore you hide the, your consumption, uh, right? Um, so I guess mail order companies of sex toys um, is, is one quite obvious example, right? Um, although they're also uh, sold in certain stores, they're particularly sort, uh, sold through mail order companies, uh, sex toys, because people don't necessarily want to be seen buying them. Um, so there is a facilitation by the producers um, that you can buy them um, through mail order companies and now, of course, online. Um, Right, so, uh, and hiding consumption can take various forms, right? And it can, of course, relate to various groups. Uh, youth can try to attempt to hide consumption from their parents or perhaps even from, the, um, from legal enforcement, but also from peer groups because it's not cool um, or not hip to be consume, seen consuming something, right? So there um, might be all sorts of reasons uh, why you want to do that. So now producers face similar um, issues, although of course completely hiding everything is difficult. Um, but um, yeah, Julien is also um, he's, he's from from France, and and there in particular the the question over meat production, which uh, in the Netherlands has also stirred up some con controversy, uh, has relied very much on 
the expose of how animals are actually treated during the uh, both the farming process and then uh, in the slaughterhouse. And by just demonstrating uh, how that production process looks, um, a lot of repugnance has been generated. So apparently these firms until that point have been successful in hiding it or hiding their method of production um, to a certain extent. And through the expose, we then come to know about it and then um, the repugnance feelings go up. Yeah. Um, so repugnance highlights that exchange, as I've um, earlier argued in a bunch of papers, is uh, basically a, th a three-way street and not so much a two-way street. It's uh, an exchange between a supplier, a consumer, and the onlookers, and the onlookers can approve or disapprove. Um, oh, here there's uh, even a third option, which is identical to the first one. Sorry about that. But... Uh, so they can approve or disapprove. So I think, um, right, um, people who've read a lot of uh, Smith moral sentiments will recognize something of the sort. I think there's some people who've recognized similar points. I once exchanged quite a lot of emails with uh, Hartmut Klimt, a uh, student of Buchanan on this subject, saying that Buchanan had also recognized something of the, of the sort. Um, but these onlookers are basically parties to the exchange. And so the question is, how do we think about them? Now, I think we can do that at a very analytical level, but here we're um, keeping it relatively close to the ground um, by seeing how firms deal with these onlookers, one might say. Um, I don't think we are the first to write on this, although I do think that we are the first to develop this as a sort of systematic frame. Um, so Julien in particular has done a, a quite comprehensive ser uh, search and, and uh, sort of inventory of uh, related literature. So there's a, a, a literature on the wages of sin, for example, for prostitutes um, who um, face um, um, in the long run um, limitations on what other jobs they can do, or perhaps even in their social sphere, they face costs of having been a prostitute or having engaged in prostitution at one point in their lives. Um, but uh, there could be other wages of sin in which uh, saying uh, being a police officer is not considered uh, an appropriate job within certain communities. So in order to induce then uh, people from, say, a minority group to also join the police force, uh, one might have to uh, offer a, a higher wage to overcome some of these wages of sin. So right, once again, I want to emphasize that this is probably culturally sensitive and dependent uh, quite heavily on the communities uh, and groups we're talking about. Now, there's a, a good lit literature that shows that uh, sin, sin stocks, say, um, for arm company uh, or uh, armament companies or oil companies uh, are relatively lower priced. So um, we can also see that it, this translates into stock prices. This basically results from the fact that demand for them is lower because uh, pension funds and other uh, major investors are pressurized not to invest in these industries. Um, so we see there a clear effect of a certain level of repugnance. Um, there's also empirical work that consumers are willing to pay more for praiseworthy goods. Well, I think this is almost so obvious that, yeah, we can, of course, f find empirical results pointing in that direction. But we know that people, of course, are very interested in buying goods that have a positive social status, right? And so you could reverse that um, when talking about repugnance because these goods have negative symbolic value. So people are probably uh, willing to pay less for them or they're incurring a subjective cost next to the market price that they're paying for these goods, right? Um, and then one of the things that's quite well documented is that repugnant firms face all sorts of constraints uh, on the advertisement and the retailing side. Um, so this is particularly in the business literature, there's uh, quite a lot on this because, right, it's just a practical problem that some firms face um, uh, while others don't, right? So say tobacco companies might be restricted from sponsoring certain uh, sporting events or um, uh, oil companies might be prevented from donating to art museums, um, uh, to, to name just uh, some of the examples that, uh, that are out there. Typically anecdotal, sometimes somewhat more systematically studied, uh, but nonetheless, I think well recognized. Um, now in our paper, we developed two small case studies to get something more of a systematic insight, but I think at some level, we still re remain at this um, level of trying to inventory what the effects of repugnance are. Um, 
So um, these include higher transaction costs to facilitate the inv uh, invisible purchases or less visible purchases by consumers because consumers don't want to be seen uh, purchasing this. Uh, they face uh, difficulty advertising, so they might incur a higher cost on that um, on, the, on that front. There is um, a, a possibly major impact on market coordination, which we don't fully explore here, but we note a couple of times because um, information and reputation mechanisms might function uh, far less well on markets that are partly hidden. Um, uh, an infamous example in the Netherlands was when the government uh, started providing tests of ecstasy pills on parties um, because um, reputation mechanisms were believed to work poorly on the market for ecstasy pills because people couldn't buy them openly and they couldn't provide each other feedback. So um, in order to um, make consumers feel safe, they offered sort of te uh, mobile testing uh, opportunities which is of course really odd because these markets weren't supposed to exist right so the market itself was illegal but the testing was offered um, by the regulator um, so repugnance acts as a cause which might uh, cause at, at at some level markets to break down um, right um, in some cases it merely leads to higher costs but in some cases it might also lead to actual markets breaking down because the costs on on both sides are basically too high so that a profitable exchange opportunity no longer exists and we see this market disappear, which in some sense you might say is success uh, because judged from the group who finds this activity repugnant, right? They're seeking, they're seeking to impose a cost on another group. So if they manage to do so in a, in a relatively a low cost manner by, by, um, by expressing their disgust and that leads to um, sufficient uh, um, costs on the side of either the producers or the consumers or both that the market breaks down, right? The activity would uh, more or less disappear without necessarily any legal intervention. Um, so the first case study, which uh, Julian did most to, um, uh, to develop, and uh, he will certainly be also be uh, open to, to question about this, is a study of uh, the um, Pornhub company, which is owned by uh, a tech technology or also a pornography um, company called MindGeek. It's an online platform which offers pornographic uh, content and um, MindGeek is the market leader. It doesn't only own Pornhub but also uh, a, a whole host of related websites. Uh, Pornhub was particularly interested because interesting from our perspective because it also offers the opportunity for uh, users to upload their own content uh, and benefit. Uh, from, from that. So it does not merely offer content, but it, it's also a platform um, at which users uh, can exchange um, their own content. Yeah. Um, so we detail uh, some of the difficulties that this company faced. Um, so it was hard to find funders or investors. The uh, company still has still not gone public, even though it's, it's, it's grown enormously. And that is um, in part because it fears that uh, people are not willing to buy this stock, which would be a sort of ultimate sin stock, I suppose. Um, and But also uh, just uh, in terms of finding other types of investors or banks interested in the product, they tried to rebrand it as a tech company. And they did, did, uh, and they did so not only toward investors, but also toward workers. And for workers, they also created circumstances, especially the tech workers, circumstances which made them as distinct from the material or as separate from the material as possible, right? So putting them in a, in a nice, uh, completely clean office with no interaction with the actual content of the website, but just developing the IT um, infrastructure for it. Um, so the scope of the product was something that they struggled very hard uh, in recent years to uh, maintain. Um, at, um, at some point, it was basically open for anyone to upload it, but the repugnance um, broke out, especially over the category known as revenge porn, in which people upload um, sexual content of their ex-partners uh, in order to shame them, um, right? And hence the word re revenge. Um, and so the company had to decide how to deal with this. Well, one solution is obviously to um, make people register 
uh, for the platform, but that would um, um, right make most users uninterested in using this platform, which offers anonymous um, uh, consumption. And so signing up would not really uh, be a viable strategy, right? And one can go through um, a, a whole, whole host of other options. One of them, which uh, again in France, especially has already led to a lot of um, public outrage is that you hire people to basically screen all the content, um, which of course is a costly process, uh, but allows you to um, sort as different categories uh, of uploaded content and remove the unwanted bits. Um, YouTube is also facing this, uh, this difficulty in, in various ways. And the screening itself is considered a very repugnant job because one watches basically uh, con controversial content all day long. Um, and so the companies are seeking actually to again hide this activity by saying, no, the algorithm does it. Um, but through exposés, it's become clear that it's, it's often human labor uh, rather than uh, algorithms doing uh, the sorting here. So they found it not near impossible to advertise or to attract advertisers, right? They are an online platform. So one major source of revenue would be to attract advertisers onto their platform. Uh, but um, established brands did not want to be associated with Pornhub. So they didn't want to um, advertise there. And if they did want to advertise, they came with new screening um, um, uh, rules or preconditions, which the company first had to meet in order to advertise there. Um, it also sponsored a, a bunch of uh, sports teams um, in, uh, and uh, that led to controversy around those sports teams, sometimes even the sports teams being excluded from the uh, national competition that they were competing in and so on and so forth. Now, what this leads to and what I think is the more interesting analytical point is that we uh, see segmentation of markets uh, happening because other repugnant um, firms are very happy to advertise on this uh, repugnant platform. Um, but this way, there's a sort of sorting happening um, inside the economy in which the, the morally um, OK or the morally praiseworthy group together and the uh, morally uh, undesirable group together. Um, OK. Uh, th there's, there's more detail, but I don't want to go into all the detail of the case. Um, that's also in the paper. Um, what's really important for uh, our analytical story is that um, Pornhub got more and more disconnected from other infrastructures, in particular financial infrastructures, right? So uh, users couldn't pay anymore with their uh, credit cards on the platform. Um, um, uh, producers couldn't get couldn't be paid anymore, so they were uh, they actually developed uh, uh, one. Um, a cryptocurrency of their own in order to overcome this problem. And what this leads to, at least that is one of the preliminary conclusions that we have in the paper, is that the firm has to virtually integrate more and more and more in order to, um, in order to, uh, to keep on running. Uh, because basically it cannot rely on all the business to business services that a normal firm can rely on. Okay, the second case is um, uh, of Sears. Um, I particularly emphasize in, in, in this case study the way in which uh, racial uh, repugnance or, um, against um, Black people around 1900 was mobilized in, an order, in order to discredit Sears and Roebuck. Um, so they were competing with uh, local uh, general purpose stores, which, uh, who drove a lot of this opposition to Sears. And they were often in cahoots with local media who were happy to, to join forces. Um, but the interesting part of this story is that a lot of the repugnance was not at all present among the public, but had to be mobilized. Um, and it was mobilized very, very successfully uh, up to the point that there were organized book burnings of the Sears catalog um, in which uh, people were stimulated to bring a Sears catalog. Um, uh, for a small reward, uh, sometimes even children were uh, mo um, recruited in, in for this task, right? And um, so there was a, a, an enormous campaign that was started in order to discredit this store, which was, of course, motivated by um, the fact that this posed a, a major commercial threat to the local companies. Um, and 
what was similarly important was that the new mail order company system upset a lot of social distinctions, right? So um, under the Jim Crow system, there was often a sort of apartheid also within the stores or black people had to wait longer. And what Sears offered was the same service to everyone. And um, that was something um, that was, um, yeah, especially um, in rural areas, um, but also sometimes in the cities, but Sears particularly targeted targeted rural areas was um, um, something of a revolution in um, the social hierarchy of the time. Yeah. Um, so we detail some of the ways in which Sears sought to overcome this, um, most, mostly right uh, hiding or bypassing it. But over time, they grew more, um, more bold as they became bigger. Um, and um, they started a sort of alternative uh, moral campaign in which they sought to justify the company. So the Sears catalog came to be branded the Thrift Book of America with a seeming endorsement from uh, uh, Teddy Rose Roosevelt. Right? That's the, uh, the early Roosevelt around um, this period. So um, there was a sort of path patriotic uh, message that this was actually the most uh, American thing to be thrifty and right, they, they appealed to another set of values. Um, and they also started engaging more and more in um, what we would now call uh, PR campaigns, especially through the Julius, uh, Julian Rosenwald uh, schools, which were a major um, effort in, uh, to provide uh, good schools to black communities uh, in and around Chicago. They were uh, one of the major philanthropic efforts, in fact, of, this, uh, of the early decades of the 20th century. Some of the schools are still around, I believe. Um, but the interesting thing is that to different groups, this actually led to more repugnance because this was um, more evidence for them, uh, for some groups that these were in uh, that Sears and Roebuck was indeed too too friendly to blacks or were um, was seeking to um, um, to change the social status quo. Yeah. So um, some implications, and then uh, I will end um, managing repugnance. Um, in our framework, I think leads to uh, three major implications. The first is about firm size, in which the repugnant firm tends to grow uh, for various reasons. Uh, one, it cannot rely on existing infrastructures or other businesses because they don't want to deal with this repugnant firm. Um, and the low visibility of new entrants, right, because they cannot advertise themselves or make themselves known to the public, functions as an entry barrier um, on these markets. So they actually might lead to monopolies. There is one obvious countervailing factor is that if one is big, one is also more likely to be the object for repugnance, um, right, because then all the moral outrage centers on this one producer rather than on the industry as a whole. Uh, and I think both of our case studies show some elements of that. Then there's managing of the scope. Um, now, this is different for, for Pornhub and, and, and Sears and Roebuck because Sears and Roebuck basically want to run uh, a legitimate, fully accepted business. Um, but Pornhub uh, wants to actually offer a somewhat repugnant good, uh, namely pornography and also amateur and certain other categories of pornography um, that by their um, nature will most likely remain repugnant for the near future. Um, and they do so in part because it's a niche that's not well served by existing companies. And so what uh, managing scope relates to is that this firm is seeking to position itself somewhere along the spectrum of accepted and, and socially okay versus um, uh, illegal and socially uh, completely out of the question. And it seeks to sort of remain in this middle in a sort of gray area where it's just accepted enough to keep on doing its business, right? And so the removal of revenge porn or the existence of revenge porn apparently moved it too far into the, to the, to the, to the, to, the, to black, the unaccepted areas or the red areas and um, too far away from this green uh, stuff. Uh, and then there's uh, managing meaning, right? Which um, I think uh, we at least offer some um, hints of how that might happen. And it is changing the cultural meaning associated with the good as well as the mobilization of repugnance by the opponents, um, right? Um, okay, 
um, I'll leave this uh, for what it is and uh, say something about the broader perspective and why I think this group should be somewhat interested in this subject. Um, I think um, repugnance in some, some form is a case of almost pure social regulation rather than a legal regulation of an industry. Um, one might say that the two actually go together um, and that the um, public sphere and the social sphere uh, both try to intervene here on the market. Um, but I was initially attracted to the subject because I wanted to sort of think of examples in which the regulation really did not come from, um, from the law, but came from uh, social pressure. Um, there is self-regulation and social regulation. So firms manage repugnance and user communities also do this. So in the future, I hope to look at how certain user communities uh, do this. Um, in my mind is always this, this famous movie, The Dallas uh, Buyers Club, which I think is a wonderful user community of uh, a, a repugnant group who uh, seeks to overcome this both within its own community and by sort of uh, staying to itself. But one might also think of communes uh, and here I have nudity campsites as, uh, as another example of um, um, users doing this. Then there's uh, issues of tolerance in designated areas with so special economic zones, I think in some sense are um, regulatory areas or, dist or uh, certain districts that are assigned as here you can do things that legally aren't fully allowed, but that we, um, yeah, if, if you don't grow too big, then it we can allow it in, 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 in this instance. So in uh, the TV series, The Wire, there's a very, uh, there's a sort of famous episode in which there's Amsterdam, which is uh, a couple of streets where drugs are made fully legal. Uh, and this is supposed to remove the problems elsewhere in society. Um, the Dutch uh, red light zone in Amsterdam was a, a clear inspiration for this because it uh, was, it was uh, run on precisely the same principles. We allow something here that we don't allow in the rest of society. Um, and I think by doing this, ultimately, I, mi I might want to move back to normativity. When is re repugnance desirable and from which perspective? So is there actually a social perspective or an economic perspective from which we can say something about whether repugnance is sometimes uh, so socially efficient or socially not efficient. And I don't think this is obvious in any sort of way because the Sears and Roebuck case really show, uh, uh, clearly shows an, 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 a case of uh, repugnance of, of a bad kind, at least from, from the perspective that we have today. Um, but I think in instances, perhaps one might think of child labor or, um, also just uh, making companies more sustainable, uh, if one believes that is desirable, then repugnance can act as a, uh, right, a non-legal source of social change. Um, so Michaela, I'm also wondering from, from the perspective of your newest book, whether you, you have some perspective on this, but right, it's an interesting question, how we judge uh, these uh, move, this sort of repugnance as merely a conservative or perhaps also a progressive or liberal force. Thank you. Okay, uh, excellent. Thank you, Erwin. Uh, that was a very uh, ex uh, clear uh, presentation, highlighting the key points of the paper. I'm sure we'll get uh, a lot of questions. So uh, for the questions, just use the raise hand uh, options, and I will, uh, and we will have a queue that I will, uh, I will use for the for the discussion. And as you do that, um, I will just offer one thought. I'll try. Okay, I will. Try, try to stay focused and just do one. Uh, so um, I usually when you encounter uh, an interesting new piece of uh, research, I find myself thinking, okay, well, there needs to be this kind of follow-up and this kind of follow-up. And, and I was very glad to hear that this is not just one project, that there will be many more, which is great. But in, uh, but in, in addition to all the other follow-ups, I think this paper might need a prequel, right? So, and sometimes prequels come second, so it's not necessary that, that you have to do it now, but um, this paper clearly is framed as um, what the response, right? What do firms do to the in response to repugnance? Uh, but the intriguing question, and, and it shows up in the paper and in the presentation in uh, on, a, on a number of, uh, um, in a number of places is the, the source of repugnance, right? And you even mentioned uh, early on the exogenous, endogenous. Um, 
sort of sources. And, and I think that's, that's something you, uh, you might want to address in your in future work with this. Um, and there are so many places where you can like find sort of uh, framing for this, right? The, um, uh, so you have uh, the disruption, especially for Sears, right? You, you have structured Sears as a as a disruptor, less with the with MindGeek, but I think that could also be done, right? Like the the uh, the disruption with MindGeek is that it's uh, user generated content. Anyway, so you have disruption, and then the entrepreneur uh, themselves they need to frame this new category, but at the same time, the. Uh, people who are threatened by the disruption also participate in the reframing, right? So uh, despite like the mainstream thinking, we don't always have well-defined preferences. There is all this, uh, um, you know, need for defining your preferences. The, the sort of, um, in the face of novelty, we basically don't know how we might feel. And then the, the entrepreneur, the new offering, there is the framing around that. And that, that's Pavel's, uh, Pavel's paper, right? The, um, with surrogacy, that you need these new categories of thought when you have new, uh, new products or new um, undertakings. But there is that other side, right? Where the framing happens sort of in this negative, uh, repugnant way. So, um, so I, yeah, I, um, I think uh, you and your, uh, both of you are kind of uncomfortable with this uh, repugnant being sort of inherent, right? Like you, it's clear in the paper, you, you treat it sort of as this uh, something that's, that's, uh, that's created. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, that's just something that I, that I hope you will take on uh, more explicitly in, in, in future papers. All righty. So um, that's, all uh, from me for now, and I have a raised hand from from Michelle. So, yeah. Hey, Michelle, go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Sorry, I was having trouble figuring out how to unmute. Yeah, I put my question in the chat. I'm interested in in exploring the idea of trying to quantify repugnance. You know, you mentioned that with the Pornhub, like, you know, it went a little too far with the revenge porn. So is there, do you think there's a way that we can quantify, it may be specific to each market, you know, what is the ideal, what is the norm, and how far can a firm afford to deviate from that norm before it has these repercussions? What are your thoughts on that? Um, so, yeah, th thanks, Michelle. I, I think this question doesn't have an easy answer because, right, this is a market and there's competition. And so the firms are seeking to move into niches that are poorly served by others. Um, and um, I think the repugnance causes these poorly served niches, um, right? And so the the, the question is, do I move in there and take this repugnance on me? Uh, now, I think for one, there is a kind of sorting mechanism happening there, right? There are some people um, who stand less to lose, right? I think in the sociological literature, there's been a lot of attention to outsiders uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and their role in also as, as social disruptors, right? Um, but it might be that um, uh, for other reasons, you have less to lose. Say, say a big company is unlikely to move into this, this niche, right? Because um, it has invested in, in serving a, a very large customer base. And um, by moving into this niche, right, it stands to, to lose a whole lot. Whereas a new entrant uh, might focus particularly on the poorly served niches and be willing to take, take on this requirement. So... That also means that I don't think there's a sweet spot. I, I actually think that if you go down low enough to individual dealers, you might go all the way to, to the very end. Uh, I mean, if we're, if we're talking a revenge porn, and this is the, the best example is not to, to cite a movie, but I'm, I'm reminded of an old Nicolas Cage movie, Eight Millimeters, uh, which is about so-called snuff movies, in which um, after uh, the sexual acts, the, 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 the girl is actually killed. Um, so now I don't know whether this, I, I know that the genre actually exists, whether it's a very big phenomenon, I don't know, but the film is basically him trying to find access to this market, which takes him a very, 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 very long time, basically the entire movie until he finally finds that, 
the, the people who do this, right? And I, I think this walking down is a good metaphor for how difficult it is to find the firm that's serving this niche. So in some sense, by focusing on relatively visible, visible firms, as we do in this paper with, with, with MindGeek and with, with Sears, right, we're still quite in the, in the relatively legitimate realm of relatively large companies that are serving niche markets, but relatively large niche markets that are not mainstream and they're not socially acceptable, um, but on which you can run uh, a perfectly uh, good business. And as you move down, right, there, the, I, I would expect firms to be, uh, this, this doesn't fit my analytical framework, but I, I, I'm, I'm thinking out loud now, I would expect the firms to grow, grow smaller um, and, and less and less visible uh, as you move down there. Yeah, as, uh, as they figure out ways to control content a little better, right? Some the, in order to stay, to maintain the, the mainstream of the, of, the, of the market, they will, uh, they will serve fewer of the, of the niche markets. Yeah, that's, that's, that's probably something that might happen. And that's uh, probably the case with sort of Facebook and, and as Facebook is policing conversations more and more, we will see other websites sort of taking on that, uh, on that role. Um, so that's probably something that might There happen. was a conservative thing that immediately emerged, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I forgot the name, but. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about, but I, I'm blanking out the name. But yes, so yeah. that's probably what I can, can I say one one small thing, Marta, to whether the firms are are disruptors or not? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I do think that this is possible. But since I'm interested in the sources of repugnance, I'm actually also interested in um, a sort of social change that leads a, an existing category of firms to become repugnant. Uh, and so I think. A prohibition during the progressive era is 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 a very clear example of this happening, right? So it's uh, it's an attempt by uh, large groups in society to to change social norms, um, and they do that by um, right obviously through um, consumer education, by awareness campaigns about the uh, social ne the negative social effects of um, of alcohol uh, abuse. They probably do so by lobbying their Congress people, but they also do it by putting right public pressure on 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 firms. Um, and so then I don't think that right the alcohol sellers could be labeled the disruptor here, but the disruptor clearly is right is a social movement that seeks to change uh, norms and therefore impose also new norms on um, um, yeah on existing companies. Oh yeah, okay, that's a very interesting sort of. Uh source where it's it's not market driven i guess um, and in the paper you mentioned air travel right so that or just pollution in general yeah. right those would be also sort of like more socially uh, sourced right but then yeah. um that bootleggers and back this right sort of kind of hard to escape that because um we have changing preferences everywhere but which ones sort of gather momentum right is uh, is that attachment to to interest necessary for uh for for those sorts of changes to to gather momentum um, yeah i don't know okay uh do we have other uh question oh three participants raised hands okay so we have uh let's see eric josh and and ross so eric please yeah yeah thank you um so I think the very definition of repugnance suffers from a sort of boundary weakness problem. It doesn't at all vitiate your analysis, but in the sense of, you know, the famous Supreme Court struggles with defining what was pornography is, you know, we know it when we see it. But I do think your, your evocation of the term norms suggests how important this boundary problem is for your, your exercise in analyzing repugnance, which I think is valuable. Again, I think the category is valuable, but when is, when is opposition to a company simply due to your economic interests? And so in the famous words of, you know, a mafioso, it's, it's just business. 
there's no repugnance here. I don't hate you. I might have to kill you even in that particular example. But with respect to many people's, I wouldn't even go so far as to say dislike because that's about to be, or I'll, that is the second category I'd like to say to you, is all dislike of a company or a person's consumption activities, is that sufficient for repugnance to obtain? Because it might well be that it, it a notion of toleration in a pluralistic society means that there's a set of things you maybe don't, it, you dislike, or at a minimum, you would never engage in that behavior in your heart of hearts. But you're like, we, I have to tolerate this in a pluralistic society, even though I don't like it. I wish these people were not engaging in this consumption. But is that sufficient to reach repugnance, which apparently includes snuff films where the one of the participants in the sexual activity is killed at the end? That seems abhorrent. And so that like the great edge case, that's truly repugnant. But Sears is an example. How many people who were opposing Sears were doing so for economic reasons? How many were doing so for aesthetic reasons that don't reach a level of repugnance, which is, I just don't like a world in which local retailers don't have a role, and I, don't, I dislike the decline of local culture concomitant there too. Is that a response to repugnance, or is that a response to, I have these other preferences, even if not strictly economic? And then finally, it's like Sears engages in a set of practices that I consider to be morally abhorrent, and those are repugnant. I worry that if you include enough of the dislike, a definition of repugnance necessarily becomes consonant with just social norms in opposition to something. I'll stop ranting. Let me know if that didn't make sense. Uh, no, I, I, I think you make perfect sense and we might have to do some conceptual work, right? I mean, in some sense, the paper just picks up on uh, a hot topic in, in, in ac academic debates. It uses that term. But I, I, I already like your um, sort of grading of the, of, the, of the categories from dislike to, to repugnance to, to abhorrence. Um, so, so I think there's something there. Of course, we cheat, cheat a little bit or we cut the corner by saying anything with a negative symbolic value to somebody, um, we're going to treat a, as repugnance. Um, but on the, on the Sears case, right? And here I'm going to try to defend why it's important to introduce this concept or to introduce some variant of this concept into economic analysis is, yes, it's economic interest, but it's economic interest expressed through moral categories. And I don't think that's the normal way you think about it, right? So in public choice, we have lots of analysis of, of um, legal attempts to raise entry barriers or to right or to restrict entry of competitors some other way and we have plenty of analysis of that right and and like Marta also brought up the bootleggers and Baptists which we also touch upon very uh, briefly at the end but there it's still um, the the moral group is sort of um, instrumental in bringing about the legislation that you wanted anyway Right, so they're sort of brought in as, a, as an additional pr pressure group uh, in order to change legislation, uh, and I uh, think that the Sears case at least brings up one other interesting mechanism in the sense that uh, communities are mobilized um, against this new company uh, in 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 very active activist ways, right? And uh, I mean, by local uh, or by domestic are just new instances of, of, of this sort of protectionist attitude that's aimed at the public, right? It's not aimed in, in order to increase tariffs at the national level, but it's really through this moral channel. Um, and I think there's, there's, there's that, that, that's the important thing I, I would argue. And yeah, then I'm, I'm gonna think more about whether we introduce some finer grading in, 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 the, uh, in, in the categories of, of dislike. But, yeah. Julien, do come in, right, when you want, want to add something. But, um... Yeah, I want to detect. OK. Uh, 
John. Uh, thanks for yeah. the paper and um, thanks uh, both for writing it and for you. presenting today. I thought it was uh, really interesting and um, it uh, definitely made me think about uh, two companies that I really hadn't thought of uh, very much, although uh, Sears uh, certainly uh, I'm familiar with, um, although not as much uh, recently. But either way, um, I'm more curious uh, about the, um, so you may have uh, like a straight prohibition or like a legal barrier on top of this social um, stigma uh, that you mostly focus on in the paper. And I'm curious if um, the, the demarcation there of just focusing on these products that are in legal markets, but uh, face this uh, significant social stigma is uh, part of, you know, uh, just the research of this paper, or if you think that, um, you know, uh, there is sort of a separate dynamic that happens in the economics of prohibition. And, um, and I say that partially because like in Alice uh, Kaysen's book on prohibition, she talks a lot about how firms also uh, started to um, integrate, like Yingling started doing uh, ice cream uh, during uh, the prohibition era. And so I, I think many of the dynamics would actually uh, transfer over uh, when there's a policy change like that. But I am curious um, if this isn't uh, an intentional um, demarcation, if you think that economics of prohibition uh, might interact differently than perhaps we thought before when you add on top the uh, social uh, stigma uh, in addition to the regulatory barriers. So, uh, Josh, if I understand you correctly, I think you're asking the hard question that I'm, I'm scribbling about on paper, but that I'm, I don't really fully know how to tackle that uh, yet. And that is the extent to which the social pressure and the legal uh, rules are complements, substitutes, or yet something else. Um, and so for drug usage, for example, um, right, as I said, in the, in the Netherlands, in, in the Netherlands where, where I live and which I know best, I think the social stigma around certain drugs is doing a lot more work than the legal uh, prohibitions against certain types of drugs. Um, and I think there, there's a clear instance of, uh, right? And I, you can also think of instances where even though something is illegal, everybody sort of agrees that, it, that, that, that it's allowed, say speeding after 10 a.m. or uh, after 10 a.m. or so. That, that, yeah, nobody would frown upon you for doing it. Uh, even though, so so there's a sort of sense, I think, there where we can clearly say they're complements. Um, but, um, right, if, 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 if they point in the same direction, they, they are complements. But I do think that they, they're on the, on the social level, social activist groups might treat them as substitutes or alternative strategies in order to bring about social change. I'm not quite sure. Like I said, I'm, I've only been scribbling about it. I find this a really, really hard, hard subject actually to, to, to fully wrap my head around about the extent to which this is all complements and, 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 and all substitutes, which also makes, reminds me that I didn't respond to Eric on, on tolerance. Um, but that was the, the final point I wanted to make to, to, to Eric's point is that um, I think if our project succeeds, we can demonstrate that tolerance is a market virtue and not merely a political virtue or an economic virtue and not merely a, a, a political virtue. But that, that is, uh, yeah, well, at the very end. But um, uh, sorry for not providing any clarity in this answer. And if I can add something, uh, an important point in the distinction between the legal status or not of some specific repugnant market is based on a recently published paper that I will add in the chat. Uh, 
it's a paper underlining that the intensity of repugnance on the market is disconnected somewhat with the legal status of uh, the product. And this is a very important point because if we focus on legal markets in our paper, we are not targeting some specific intensity of repugnance. And I think this is a very important point to, to, to underline. And of course, if we focus on legal markets, it's also a way to connect to the public relation literature, because of course, with illegal markets or markets of this kind, it's more hard to understand the, the, the communication strategy of the firm. Even if we have some exceptions, of course, in in the illegal markets. And we have this book of Diego Gambetta about the communication of the Yakuza. And of course, Yakuza are somewhat firm with a public relations strategy, but it's you know an exception. And this is, I think, an important point. If we focus on legal market, it's a way to connect to public relations, but also we are not targeting you know, a range of repugnance feeling because uh, with this recent paper I had it on the chat, we can disconnect somewhat the legal status of the product and the intensity of repugnance of consumer. All right, uh, excellent, thank you. Uh, so uh, I think we can move on to, to Ross, yes. Hi, thank you, Erwin, thank you for the paper. I, I have two comments, one um, on one side of the market and the other on the other side. Um, the, um, you might not know this, but um, after prohibition was done, it was still illegal in every state in the US to create home brewed beer. And the process of the, the, um, the allowance, allowing people to home brew is an interesting history. In fact, one of my former students in Michigan at Michigan State um, wrote his uh, undergraduate dissertation for me on um, the variety of rules across the 50 states on home brews. And it actually helped to write his PhD at George Mason on that, but he ended up becoming a health economist instead. But uh, he was a George Mason student. <clears throat> um, and um, one of the things I discovered in that process um, was that for the entirety of the prohibition era, um, there were ads that appeared regularly in um, magazines for, uh, say, um, mechanics who work on cars or for, for people who worked in, um, in fixing houses um, or in small appliances. Um, there were ads that appeared that were never self-identifying as to who who was behind them, but it simply said for a recipe of, um, for, for a book of recipes that used some term, uh, please, uh, e please write to the following address and send a postage paid envelope in your, um, your letter. And it actually went to the Paps Brewing Company in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And Paps would provide you with a booklet of um, ways to make home brew, but it would arrive surreptitiously with no return address, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is an interesting um, sort of characterization of some of the problems you're discussing where a legal business um, who, who is a major player in an industry um, is also trying to support in a sense, a competitor, but also uh, just the, the ongoing nature of home brew, um, because their product actually was used, for example, people would use the same product in, um, in some other brews, uh, like um, making uh, bread with beer in it, you could, um, you could use these packets for other purposes. So that's, that's an interesting story that you might want to track down or think about. The other, um, the other one I have is, um, I typically think of, um, me of medical marijuana shops in the US uh, as we came out of the prohibition against marijuana, uh, first allowing medical marijuana. It was still the case that the medical marijuana shops looked, I want to say, they looked like porn shops. They fit the sort of characteristics. Uh, they were in 
uh, rundown malls. Um, they used garish lighting. Um, they packaged things with unusual names, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that's happened as, um, as marijuana has become legalized in the US is that the storefronts at which you buy marijuana have come to look much more like a cell phone store than a porn shop. And my son is in this industry. So uh, he works for one of the companies that creates the plant. He doesn't, they don't sell medical marijuana, uh, they don't sell marijuana, but they sell the platforms that you can use to, to buy and sell marijuana. Uh, the, the tablet platforms, like the one when you go to the cell phone and they, with, to buy your cell phone and they ask you what they have and all that kind of stuff. He writes all those kinds of software platforms. And, um, and the stores have really scaled up. I spent the entire spring and summer driving by um, a marijuana shop, not knowing it was a marijuana shop. The name of the shop was Sky Mint. Um, it looked like a uh, cell phone store or some kind of upscale supplier. It was a marijuana shop. So a total, so a total move away from repugnance to uh, sort of trying to completely repackage itself as totally legitimate, not, nothing repugnant, come in and spend the afternoon, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I think that the sort of the reversal of repugnance may be something to look at as well with some of these industries. Um, yeah, thanks, Russell. I think we have two relatively obvious analogies to your stories, the, the one being the middleman who offered their Sears catalog for viewing at their home. I, I think this also goes back to, to Michelle's point before, I think, or the, the point I made in response to Michelle about sorting, right? So certain people apparently were okay with the stigma, um, right? And, and received people in their home. And uh, so the well-respected families could, um, right? Um, buy uh, at Sears without being seen uh, buying at Sears. Uh, so I think that, 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 that's an interesting thing, but I think your homebrew example is actually richer because it brings up the fact, right, that these uh, liquor companies apparently had an interest in maintaining, but yeah, th these were other notes I was once engaged in, but I called it a culture of appreciation, right? Every good to thrive needs a kind of culture of appreciation and by stimulating, right, um, actually good recipes, right, um, their type of liquor would actually uh, probably survive. And so there would also be, be, be beer and not just French wine after prohibition. I don't know what the, what the relevant competitors were. Um, the homebrew uh, ban or lifting the homebrew ban has also been exploited in a very cute econometric or a legal econometric paper to demonstrate how it gave rise to um, craft beer industries in different states, uh, the way it was lifted uh, in, in different years. On the medical marijuana stores, I want to say one thing is that this, this, this repugnance or the, the way that they were previously presented, right, as sort of being also presenting themselves in a sort of repugnant way, makes it very hard to distinguish between the different products that were being sold uh, for, for customers. And that probably has changed 100% now. So an important thing in, in, uh, and that happened every year in Amsterdam was actually the, the weed cup, which at first when I heard about it was a little bit silly because I thought, okay, this is just a celebration, right? And they, they brought Snoop Dogg or so over or somebody else famous, right, uh, a, a pop icon who, who smoked. But of course, what they were doing was providing uh, uh, customer information, right, in the same way that that exists for every normal industry, but is uh, less acceptable here. So the, the providing information mechanisms, right, and yeah, what uh, in French sociology is called judgment devices, in order to differentiate between these these goods in a way that otherwise would not be be possible. And I, I think, yeah, looking at one of those transitions of those industries and how um, the quality of the product actually increases alongside that, and yeah, in Amsterdam this went so far that uh, all the 
uh, tourists were actually told to not smoke pure joints because it, the quality in Amsterdam at that point was far too, too good. So they were used to the bad product at home. So then when they would come to Amsterdam and smoke, they would be yeah, blown away sort of. Um, so um, there you go. Maybe, uh, okay. So uh, uh, do we have any more questions from the, from the room? Let's see, I'm gonna look at my, I'm gonna look at my notes, sorry. I do have one more, if I may, since sure. nobody's on the queue. Yeah, go um, ahead, Josh. So uh, your example of uh, the Mind Geek is really interesting. I mean, the fact that they integrated all the way into their own currency, I think, is just fascinating. Um, but I'm curious, uh, like with other industries, um, like British American Tobacco uh, came on my radar because they actually ended up coming out with a, a COVID vaccine because they uh, somehow the vaccine uh, used some sort of plant technology. And so they, as a tobacco manufacturer, were like pretty good with a uh, um, biotechnical uh, um, industry uh, production or something like that. Obviously that's not my field. Uh, so I may be getting some of the terminology mixed up there, but um, I am curious to the extent to which um, you're, if you have a theory perhaps that explains whether or not the integration is gonna um, really serve toward the facilitation of the repugnant activity like with uh, MindGeek, or if uh, a firm will engage more in something like uh, the British American tobacco example where it's just sort of um, using heterogeneous capital to serve uh, various uh, entrepreneurial activities that um, sort of are already within the scope of the firm. And if there's any way to sort of sort through a mechanism for figuring out um, uh, perhaps in a broad way, which way the company might lean on those. Yeah, so, so Julianne did most of the conceptual work on, on this part, but it makes me at least think, Julianne, we're not in the same room, but on the, the vertical and the, the horizontal integration differentiation that we make. But. Yeah, uh, concerning vertical integration, I think an important point is to say that in the, the, in the empirical literature, we see the fact that, for instance, as soon as advertising is banned, we, we see more concentration, for instance, or where, uh, when the access to funding is also restricted, you also have more concentration. So as soon as we say that some specificities of the firm uh, in a repugnant market uh, are characterized by the difficulty to access to investment, uh, the, the difficulty to make sponsorship to, or to, or to uh, advertise the product. Of course, we can say, okay, so we know what are the consequences of markets with these characteristics and the repugnant firms we are studying are also facing these constraints. So we can say that we have, and we will face probably more of Vertical integration, and this is the point for MindGeek. And of course, for MindGeek, we observe uh, this vertical integration. But of course, we should maybe construct a, a more theoretical framework to explain the link between repugnance and the possibility of vertical integration. And concerning, uh, of course, the possibility for this firm to to clean their reputation by funding some uh, charitable causes or, or, or things like that. What is very interesting is the fact that, for instance, Pornhub is trying uh, to, to, to invest in uh, valuable uh, activities. But most of the time, people do not want to be associated with Pornhub, even if they provide some funds and for uh, interesting causes. And I think this is a very important aspect of uh, the of repugnant firm is the fact that even if you try to do some public relations by charitable funding, you will face some difficulties because people do not want to be associated with you. And for Pornhub, this is particularly clear. Yeah. I mean, well, I'll give one, I'll throw one more example at because I was so excited over the summer. I said, Julien, our theory is now confirmed, but that was when OnlyFans banned um, for two weeks, I think, 
um, sec, uh, explicit content from, from their website and then let everybody back on. Uh, more silently than they announced it, the ban, but uh, yeah. Excellent. Um, then we see, uh, there's one more race then, to, uh, am I right? Let's see here. Yeah, Cameron and Eric both. Oh, yeah. Okay. Ramani, go ahead. All right, so the, the aspect of vertical integration is an interesting part of the story, but I wonder about something like drug cartels. Drug cartels, my impression is that they are highly horizontally integrated, but vertically disintegrated. And I wonder what's the difference between drugs as a repugnant market and porn as a repugnant market, such that one is highly vertically integrated and the other highly horizontally. Are you trying to trick me, Cameron? But because I, I think the the the, the example is my impression me, correct. Okay, yeah, but I, I think your impression is correct, but I think that the legal uh, difference makes all the difference here because the reason to not verti vertically integrate is to, uh, uh, to limit the liability of any actor for criminal prosecution. Uh, and so there's, an, uh, there's another logic that is uh, apparently more powerful in the, in the drug market um, than it is in the... Uh, but the, the, the drug market, I wouldn't completely go along with, with your... Uh, Story. I mean, again, this is too much film evidence, and so so the legal markets are are not. But right in the in in the Godfather, there are famous discussions about going into the drug market or not, or staying with with liquor and gambling, uh, the 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 two hustles that they had perfected so far, and which they uh, had um, uh, become a big firm in, and so they were clearly managing the scope. Uh, of the organization um, to stay within such boundaries that they didn't have to touch the dope. And basically only when the firm, when the, the firm started turning bad, they also had to go to, to, to selling or go into the drug market. So in some sense, I think um, for drug, cartel, drug cartels, we do actually see the managing scope dynamic. Um, and yeah, at least as it's depicted in the Godfather, sorry for having so many movie references, but is that with the liquor and gambling, they could still lobby to the politician that features a minor role in, in the movie, but when they would go turn into a drug cartel, they could no longer do this. So, so I do see some evidence, at least uh, also very, very anecdotally of, of, of this managing repugnance, even of the drug cartel. So I wouldn't say that they go fully, fully, fully horizontal. Uh, I have one uh, clarifying question on that. So in the paper, you, you talk about MasterCard and Visa dropping sort of this partnership with, with Pornhub. Um, the, did they drop them after uh, Pornhub, uh, after MindGig already uh, invested in their own cryptocurrency? Or, so what came first, right? And I guess, um, do we know how much in terms of revenue, like what, uh, what kind of um, call, um, trade-off it was for, for MasterCard and Visa? Was it like was it cheap for them to do this sort of virtual signaling or or not, right? And and were they uh, did they prompt the development of cryptocurrency or was the cryptocurrency the, the prompt for MasterCard and Visa to, to drop? Right. Anyway, I don't know if, uh, if that's something you, you looked into. Yeah, uh, concerning the Titcoin cryptocurrency, it appeared before, uh, of course, the, the, the clash with uh, Visa and MasterCard, but initially Titcoin was created, you know, uh, as a sort of parody in a context in which you had many, many uh, cryptocurrencies uh, appearing. And um, the Titcoin money was initially created to to pay uh, the amateur performance according to the number of views they are creating. So it was, you know, uh, uh, like you, you, you had only purchase power on uh, the Pornhub website. But as soon uh, as when MasterCard or Visa said, no, we do not want uh, to work anymore with Pornhub, a Titcoin a change of nature and became a way to, 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 to really pay uh, the, the professional performers. Uh, and no, the part partnership uh, came back. So Visa and MasterCard are now again accepted on the platform. You, you still have uh, 
I don't remember exactly, but you still have a very important company. Uh, I think Visa, you cannot use it on Pornhub, but MasterCard, no, you can. PayPal say, okay, no, we do not work uh, with Pornhub anymore. And then they came back. So you had some problem like this, but the Titcoin cryptocurrency is an important point because of course it changed uh, as soon as the firm faced more problems with how to pay the performers. And this is a very important point. And if it's possible, uh, as I am talking, I, I, I would like to deepen a remark to Cameron because I think a point that is very important uh, in the paper concerning vertical integration is the idea that, uh, of course, uh, repugnant market have some legal framework in which they can, uh, they, 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 they can practice their activities. But what is interesting is that in most repugnant market, the, regul the regulator is not strictly looking at the activities because you know, he, he's trying to push uh, his attention to his activities. And if you look at the porn industry today, I think you can find um, many similarities with the Hollywood industry in the 40s in the sense of a very strong vertical integration with the distribution, uh, the production of the movies and all the things like that. And as a repugnant market, if Pornhub wants to be uh, a more you know, acceptable activity, it will probably, you will probably have some antitrust law concerning pornography, exactly in the same vein that you had some antitrust laws concerning Hollywood in the 40s. And I think the vertical integration of Pornhub is related to the repugnant nature of the activity because the regulators are not looking strictly at all the market coordinates when the market is repugnant. Okay. Okay. Uh, but, but, uh, okay. But yeah, sorry, now we're thinking out loud and we're not in the same, same room, but Julianne, this would mean that Cameron's point is actually much better because, um, right, drug uh, cartels also form cartels between each other, and this was in a large extent to manage um, their own dealings, uh, right? And this point of self-management of the industry of not right going too far into the red zone but staying or at the black zone and staying somewhere gray of course requires actually a form of coordination between the different suppliers because otherwise this self-management cannot really happen um so i think there's there's stuff there to explore but yeah okay all righty well uh i am i'm glad to see that uh, we're um generating some new thinking some new thoughts that's the point of this of this uh, endeavor of the seminar so uh so it's great that there's some brainstorming happening uh, here uh thank you all so much for coming on the call uh Erwin, thank you for an excellent uh, presentation julian thank you for coming in and then and adding to the to the discussion uh, we will be meeting uh, in uh, four weeks for the presentation by, by Vlad. I will uh, send out Vlad's paper in a couple of days along with the uh, YouTube link to, to this recording. But yeah, Ervin, thank you. Uh, great job. We'll be looking out for, for subsequent papers. So yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. Really enjoy it and learn. Yeah, thanks. Yeah.